Well, I think the appropriate thing to say is Christ is risen. Let's try it again. Christ is risen. There we go. Uh, Good morning and welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church on this Easter Sunday. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, If you're a guest with us, uh, please take a minute, if you like, and tear off this slip in the order of worship. Drop it in the offering plate as it comes by later, and we'll uh, mark your name down and harass you in the weeks and months to come. Uh, We'll call and we'll email, we'll write letters, and maybe even send a telegraph or two. Uh, No, but we would like to know you, and uh, we'd be grateful if you would fill that form out. If you'll flip over on the back, uh, we'll talk just a few minutes about announcements that are coming up. The, uh, of course, the most pressing announcement is the Easter egg hunt that I hope you've all heard about. It's right out there on the lawn after the service. Uh, the parents are asked to gather the children, and we'll, they'll meet in the chapel down the stairs back there. If you don't know where that is, just follow Bridget and uh, anybody else that has children. And uh, they'll be dismissed out onto the lawn from the chapel back there. You'll also see that the Brotherhood Cookout at Cordell Tolliver's house is Monday night. Uh, There's been some confusion about the Finance Committee meeting, whether it was last week or this week. It is this week, Tuesday evening at 5.30. And then Wednesday, we have our business meeting. It got pushed back a week because of Holy Week, and the Brotherhood is doing a pancake dinner that is a fundraiser for the Brotherhood and also for the youth. So Bob Ettinger, I think it was, said, come, bring your wallet, and bring your stomach, and support those two ministries. The last thing that I'll announce this morning, uh, actually two more things, I lied. Uh, One will be the KBF, Spring Gathering, that's our state-level denominational group, is this next coming weekend, Friday and Saturday. And the last thing is that the church office will be closed on Monday for Easter Monday. So if you're trying to get a hold of us on Monday, good luck. But if you need us, we'll be here on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Well, those are the announcements. Holy Week is always full. Very shortly, we will start our uh, celebration of Jesus' resurrection on this Easter Sunday. Very shortly, we will hear the brass and the choir and all kinds of good stuff. On our way to that, I invite each of you to stand and greet the person next to you.
Christ is risen, and we'll sing our praises. Our hymn is number 194, and after we sing the introit, I'll ask you to stand and sing with us all the stanzas. this past week has been one of mixed emotions, a faith struggling to understand. We have greeted you with palm branches and sat at the table for a farewell meal. We've witnessed your death on a simple wooden cross. But on this third day, the shadows of Good Friday burst forth into light and color and Easter Sunday. Rise in our lives today as we worship you, for you are our hope, our life, and our joy. Amen. 
Will you be seated and will you take your litany of joy as we read together? Come and see. Come and rejoice. God calls us together for celebration. Enter into this time of worship with thanksgiving. Receive once more the good news of hope. God is our strength and our song. God is active in Jesus of Nazareth for our salvation. The gates of righteousness have opened to us. Jesus promises to meet us along life's way. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. After meeting with Cornelius, the centurion, Peter speaks the good news to the Gentiles, a reading from the book of Acts. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with holy spirit and power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to, that, to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of both the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here ends the first lesson. Let us turn aside and prepare our hearts for prayer. Good and gracious God, on a day like this, words escape us. Words escape us because you did the heavy lifting for us. You did the work of redemption. You did the work of salvation and offer it to us. God, words escape us on days like these, but we will try anyway this morning to say our prayers. We will pray for our world for the many people in it, and all the different issues and celebrations that they hold in one hand and the other. We will pray for our nation and the same issues and celebrations that it holds, for its leadership, uh, both in political office, in religious office, wherever they're found, leadership, in business, and elsewhere. God, we pray for our state and our town, we pray for the growth that we hope to see here, that we are seeing here, but that isn't quite fast enough sometimes. And God, we pray for our church, for the people sitting in the pews next to us on the left and on the right. We pray for the needs that they bring to this place. We pray that you will be in their hearts, warm their hearts with your presence today, warm your hearts with their hope, with your hope, this day. And God, we pray for ourselves. Always pray for ourselves when we pray. We pray that we will ever be attuned to the spirit that you have put in our lives. That you will ever be attentive to the spirit that leads us onward 
in our Christian journey. And God, if nothing else, we pray the Lord's Prayer together. We pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. In one voice, we say it boldly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our response to prayer is number 208 in your hymnal, He is Lord. Will you sing together with us? I invite all the children to join me down front for children's time. Wow. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you're all here and look so pretty in all your Easter clothes and handsome. I'm sorry, gentlemen, you look handsome in your Easter clothes. And everybody, well, we're going to talk about this week. What is today? Who can tell me what today is? Easter what is it? Easter Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. Come on. It's okay. You sit right down here with us. All right. So it's Easter Sunday, and we know that's a special Sunday. Did you all know that's the most special day as Christians that we have? It's it's even more, surprisingly, it's even more special than Christmas. Yeah, it's the most special Sunday that we have. But we didn't start having Easter today. We actually started celebrating last Sunday. How many of you all remember these? Last Sunday, yeah, last Sunday, we had Palm Sunday, and this is a palm branch, and we have Palm Sunday to talk about when Jesus came to Jerusalem for the special celebration that was going on, and all the people stood in the streets, and they waved, and they said, yay, Jesus, we love you, Jesus, and they put him on the ground, and it was really exciting, it was a big celebration, And then, skip a couple days ahead, on Thursday, we had what we called Maundy Thursday. And we celebrated another special day that Jesus had when he got together with his disciples, with his special followers, and they had a last meal together. And he had bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to all of his friends, and he said, every time you eat bread, remember what I'm going to do for you. And then he had a cup, and it had some juice in it, and he passed it around, and they all took a drink. And he said, every time you drink something, remember what I'm going to do for you. And his disciples were like, what do you mean you're going to do for us? What are you talking about? What are you going to do for us? Because they didn't know yet. And then after they had their food, Jesus got a bowl of water, and he took a rag, and he got it wet, and he washed their feet. Because back then, this is probably pretty cool, back then you didn't have to wear shoes. You could walk around barefooted. And some people did, and the roads were really dusty, and so their feet got dirty. And so Jesus, instead of getting a servant to do it, Jesus got down on the ground, and he washed the disciples' feet. And they said, why are you doing this? This is not your job. And he said, because I'm here for you. 
I am here not because of something else, but just because of you. I am here to be your servant. And they still didn't understand. They didn't get it quite yet. But then we celebrate Good Friday on Friday. And what is this? Anybody know what this is? It's a cross. And we celebrate Good Friday. And we call it Good Friday because we know something good happened afterwards. But Good Friday is the day that they put Jesus on the cross. And he died. And it was a really sad day for a little while. And everybody was sad. And they took him down. And they put him in a tomb. And they couldn't visit him for a couple days. And so then they came back. Uh Uh-oh. Well, I don't have anything for Sunday, for Easter Sunday. I don't have anything. Oh, no, did I forget? Nope, you know what? I don't need anything for Easter Sunday. Because when they went back to the tomb to get Jesus and to make him ready to be buried, he wasn't there. Because Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. And so they didn't have anything. They didn't have Jesus because he was in their hearts, just like he's in our hearts. So I don't have anything to show you, but if you look down and you look at your heart, everybody look down, look at your heart, there's what I can show you because Jesus is in your heart and he's with all of us now because he came for us and he died for us, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again and he's in heaven and he's in every single one of us. And that's what makes Easter super special. It's because that's the day that we got to have Jesus in our hearts. Isn't that pretty awesome? Will you all pray with me? God, thank you for giving us your son. And thank you for giving us the celebration that is Easter. And help us always remember that Jesus is in our hearts. Amen. Jesus' disciples, including Mary Magdalene, raced to the tomb in the early morning hours of the third day. A reading from the Gospel of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them the things he had done and things he had said to her. Here ends the gospel lesson. Our hymn of stewardship is the day of resurrection, number 214 in your hymnal. And I'll ask you to sing the first verse and the third verse together, but it begins with the choir and instruments. I'll turn around when it's time for you to stand.
Join me in prayer. Lord, we are grateful this morning. We are grateful for each who's here today. We're grateful for those who've come before us and made today possible. We're grateful for those who are young now and will someday lead. Mostly, Lord, we're grateful for the immense hope, the joy, and the confidence that you bring on Easter Sunday to each one of us, that you love us, that you have forgiven us, and that you call us each by name. We give thanks and we answer, here am I, Lord. Take these gifts, these offerings, take us and use us to glorify your name and to accomplish your task in this kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, I am grateful for brass and for choirs and for music that helps tell the story of Easter Sunday because I'm afraid that words aren't enough. We're talking about something that's so big that I'm afraid words may never be enough. Uh, But being a Baptist preacher, that's not going to stop me from trying. I know you thought you were going to get out after I said that, but no. Um, I'm going to give it a shot, but, uh, but words may not be big enough for today, Resurrection Sunday. I thought of uh, three different vignettes that I would start with, and the first one is, each, is centered around each night when we get ready to go to sleep. After the lights are switched off and your eyes begin to adjust to the darkness, something in the room, you look around for it, It tells you that you're in the right room, you know. You're looking for something that says, this is right, this is familiar. And uh, this is is my room, that's what you're looking for. Now, maybe it's the glow of a digital alarm clock on the stand next to the bed, red or green or orange or whatever color it is. Maybe it's the glow of the TV that sits on the dresser down at the other end of the room. You don't ever watch anything on it, but the glow helps you fall asleep. At least that's what I do. Uh, Maybe it's the scent of your pillow that you recognize when you lay down. Or maybe it's the scent of the person next to you that you recognize that lets you know, yeah, this is right. This is my room here. Each night before I go to sleep, I subconsciously look for these things, and it's quick, it's quick, it's not a long process. Christy will tell you that. Uh, About the time my head hits the pillow, uh, maybe even before, I'm gone uh, every night. It's not that I didn't have a good day, but I'm tired, and I just kind of drift off knowing that I'm in my space, needing to rest, needing to recover. The second is each fall, I thought of the fall, and the change on the mountains around Middlesboro. Like clockwork, every, uh, every I guess it's September, October, uh, the trees start to change colors in the hills around the town, and they go from that familiar green that we looked at for months and months and months, and they start turning orange and yellow and red uh, kind of like our stoles and our pyramids do, that familiar green to those other colors. If you've lived in Middlesboro for very long, you probably would say that fall is at least your second favorite season, right? If not your first, I've never heard anybody around here say, man, I can't stand the fall. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so colorful, you know, <laughs> the fall. Um, there's, there's something about the hills around town that make the, pa- the fall here have a sort of pomp and circumstance, a kind of triumphalism at the end of the summer. And if you lived your whole life on another planet, and then you came into Middlesboro, and a lot of us do that, uh, but if you came into Middlesboro, you'd say, man... I don't know what this is, but this looks important. This looks very special here. Of course, we know, living here, as long as some of us have, uh, that the fall is filled with irony, that that burst of color, that burst of red and yellow and orange and green is not necessarily an energetic transformation but it's, uh, it's the trees and the grass saying, it is finished for another season. I am tired. I have to rest. The third vignette was that I thought of church life, of all things. I don't know why I thought of that. I was coming here. Uh, but ever so often, a church strides strongly in a good era. Sunday school classes are full People don't notice the pews for all the shoulders and heads that sit above them. And the numbers on the back of the bulletin 
that have three and four and maybe even five digits say, yeah, we're strong now. Things are up. It's almost like you can taste and see God's blessing by looking around the room in those times. The church feels like a beacon of light, maybe, to the community, a beacon of hope, a beacon of, well, an example, I guess. But uh, we all know that numbers aren't what show God's blessing, that that's never been how it worked, that the number of pews filled equals the blessing amount from God. That's not the way grace works. And, uh, and if the church that we're talking about lasts long enough, and many of them do, it will eventually do what the trees do. It will explode in color. It will flourish for a while. And then it will need to rest. Then it will say, it is finished this season. And it will lay dormant for a while and rest and recover. Sleep, nature's cycles, human generations and eras. These are inescapable, inevitable cycles in every human being's life, in all of our lives. And while sleep can be a blessing, it's not always. There are sleepless nights with indigestion or pain or grief. And while seasons can be pleasing, They aren't always either. Uh, You know, it's exciting for a while, and then you have to go to the doctor and get your allergy medication, right? Yeah. Or your cocktail of allergy medications if you live here, I've been told. Because there's something about this bowl that holds it all in, and we kind of swim around in spring and fall. Seasons can be nice, but not always. And then there's decline and loss. We hate to talk about that, especially on Easter. But they feel like arch enemies. They feel like those things that we need to fight against. And yet, nothing human, nothing human lasts forever. Nothing human grows exponentially forever. Not the stock market. Not the United States of America, not our town or any other town, not this church or any other church. Nothing human grows exponentially forever. Now, I tell you all that because I believe that's the lesson of Lent. That's Lent's lesson. And we've been spending the last, uh, you know, six weeks learning it, so I thought it was important to recap it. Lent's lesson... Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, is that Lent is the winter season of Christian living. Lent is the winter that we go through every year. It even coincides with part of the winter. It snowed last week in April. I don't know about that here. But Lent is the time that's lean, that we lean into and learn from the winter the sparseness. We practice in our music, in our prayers, in our sermons, the hopes that when winter really comes, we in our real lives outside this place will be ready. We practice here for that. That brings me to today's text. We find the disciples wandering in that winter time of Lent. It wasn't Lent for them because Lent didn't exist yet, but they were wandering in that winter time. It all happened so fast for them. you got to remember, one moment Jesus was parading in on the back of one or two animals, we never did figure that out, waving the palm branches on either side. There are people everywhere. The gates are open. It's a cacophony. One moment That's happening. That's the flourish, the colors, all that stuff. And the next moment, the enthusiasm fades away. Fades might be too long a word for what happens because Jesus gets arrested 
not long afterward. And the disciples and the crowd scatter not long afterward. And everybody's left in this twilight looking for clarity, holding their fear. Now, that's where I think Mary Magdalene finds herself in this story. Mary Magdalene is the central character of this story, believe it or not, though Jesus is obviously important. She's the central character. The text says that while it was still dark, she ran over to the tomb. Well, she didn't run yet. She walked to the tomb, I guess. And she was crying, and tears rolled down her cheeks. It was still dark outside. And Mary Magdalene is going toward the tomb that she remembers Joseph of Arimathea laying Jesus in. And I imagine Mary feeling her way along because it's dark. And she's feeling, and the tears are trickling. And she feels a little further. And then her heart skips a beat. And she feels a little further. I should have been there by now. She feels a little further, and then that cold, damp change on her fingertips. She feels that. She feels that. And she says to herself, the door's not there. I've reached into the tomb. Can you see Mary's angst this morning as she does this? She's reaching, and the tomb is open. The tomb is open. She's timidly searching, and then she's startled, and she takes off running, and she goes back to find the disciples, Peter and the beloved disciple that John never names. She gets there, and she's out of breath, and she gets there, and she says, they have taken the Lord from the tomb. That's alarming, to say the least. It's okay to be alarmed, but they were, and they start running. They run from the tomb, Peter and the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple gets a head start, but Peter outpaces him. Ever zealous Peter outruns the beloved disciple. And Peter gets to the tomb first, sticks his head in, sees the cloth laying there, and then steps back. And then the beloved disciple sees the cloth laying there, and John says something curious. He says, the beloved disciple believed. He believed. But Peter and the beloved disciple both, regardless of who believed, then turn and return to their homes. I always wondered what that walk back to home felt like for them that morning as the sun starts to creep up over the hill. I suspect that uh, they expected to see something there, uh, something like like Jesus was talking about. Whatever it was, they expected something. And I imagine as they walk back, their head's a little low, their shoulders are a little rounded, and they're murmuring back and forth, saying, We've been waiting for three days already. Surely he wasn't wrong about what he said. We thought maybe we would find it today. That's why we ran. We thought we'd get there and see that moment of clarity we've been waiting for. And we would go, there, that's it, that's it. But they didn't turn the corner yet. Mary stays behind. Now sobbing, not just tears, but sobbing, leaning next to the tomb. And that is when something happened. Things get a little weird at this tomb. We aren't told that the sun's come up yet, but two men in white appear there in the tomb. And momentarily, they only say one thing. They look at Mary and they say, why are you crying? Why are you crying? They're sitting in the tomb, by the way. It it gets a little strange. And uh, Mary says, for the second time, they have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they have taken him to. The strange men just disappear. It's a strange twilight story. And then the gardener shows up, the gardener. I think it's a beautiful coincidence that she uh, mistakes Jesus for the gardener. Because you might remember the very first time God is characterized in the Bible uh, is as a gardener 
in the Garden of Eden, planting a new creation, shaping and molding the first human being and blowing life into that creation. Mary Magdalene, uh, she confuses Jesus with a gardener, somebody who plants, waters, weeds, and provides the conditions for new life to spring up. Isn't that good? I think it's fitting that she mistakes him for a gardener because, uh, because of the theme of creation. It harkens back to the first creation, and it asks the question about recreation. What does recreation look like now here with this strange gardener? And the gardener is the third person to ask why she is crying. Uh, you would think that somebody would have figured it out by now. She's standing next to a tomb. But he asked, and uh, she answers the same thing. They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. And then it happens. Jesus, who is the gardener, of course, calls her by name. Mary. Mary. And I... Uh, I imagine it's like when you answer the phone, if you don't have caller ID, and before the person on the other side tells you what their name is, you know who they are by their voice, right? Usually. Uh, And so Jesus says, Mary. And of course, Mary instantly recognizes him then. It's still dark, we think. But Mary throws her arms around Jesus, and they say a few words, and then Jesus says, you can't cling to me. Because John is already looking for the ascension. I have to go on. I have to go away again. You cannot cling to me. So Mary lets go of Jesus, turns around, and runs back to Peter and John a second time. And she gets there panting and bursts through the door and says, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord, she says. We've heard this story so many times that we might miss the scandal in the details. I have seen the Lord, she says. It's a scandal against experience. Dead people don't get up, right? It's a scandal against reason. Once someone is gone, they're gone. It's a scandal against science. And yet, and yet Mary runs in here. I have seen the Lord. It's a messy text. And what does she mean? Uh, does she mean what they think she means? Could it be Je- Peter and the beloved disciples start to think again? Well, can this be true? We just came from there, and we didn't see the Lord and, and all that. And Mary says, I have seen the Lord. She comes announcing her own resurrection sighting her own resurrection sighting. Now that's the text. If nothing else, we say the text today because that story is just too good not to repeat. But, uh, but Karl Barth, very famous uh, 20th century theologian, uh, once said of Easter Sunday, uh, I was reading this this past week, thinking of you, and he said that to one degree or another, Uh, The reason that people show up on Easter Sunday is to ask this question. Is it true? Is it true that God lives and gives us life? If that's why you're here, then Karl Barth was right. Is it true? Is it true that God lives and gives us life? Now, Admittedly, each of you will have to ultimately answer that question for yourself. I know you love it when I say that to you. Uh, But I'll tell you where I have seen the Lord recently. Each morning when I wake up to a new day after going to bed exhausted, I, like Mary, say, I have seen the Lord. Each spring, no matter how cold winter's winds were, no matter how many pipes burst, when my lawn pops up and needs mowed and I have to start using the flonays again, I say, I have seen the Lord. Each time I visit a sick person one week and then go back the next week 
and see her healthy and smiling and feeling better. I have seen the Lord. Each time I see Middlesbrough collect Christmas boxes for the hungry, each time I see a new home built in McCreary County, or a new ceiling fan hung by repair affair in a living room, each time I hear the singing of the God's Angels class come down that hallway back there, I have seen the Lord. Each time I sit in the chapel with ashes falling down over my brow, maybe even on my nose. Each time I see those palm branches waved by the children as they come down this aisle singing Hosanna. Each time I sit in that dim space as the candles go out on Monday, Thursday, I have seen the Lord. Each time I sit and have a good conversation with one of you, each time I sit by bedside and add my voice to your prayers that you're already praying, each time I get the privilege to stand here and try to say a few words and hope they are a sermon, I have seen the Lord. Easter in John's gospel is about resurrection sightings. John's Easter is a resounding yes to the question that you came to ask. Is it true? Yes, I have seen the Lord. In the breath of a newborn baby, right? In the tulips that braved the sleet last week. In the singing of a few around an ICU bedside. In the energy of people and a church ready to bloom into new life once more. Easter, after all, is the season, the spring season of the Christian calendar. If Lent is winter, Easter is spring. Is it true, Bart said, is it true that God lives and God gives us life? Yes, we say, we see the Lord. And not just that. As we hold the whole story together now, all the way back to Ash Wednesday, all the way back before that even, we realize all the things that don't get the last word at Easter. Violence doesn't get the last word. Despair doesn't get the last word. Aches and pains don't get the last word. Sagging economies don't get the last word. Political power That doesn't get the last word. Drugs don't get the last word. Broken families, betrayal, they don't get the last word. Hypocrisy, condemnation, persecution, exclusion, hatred, hunger, money, greed, fear, none of these things get the last word. All of these things are those rags laying in the tomb, discarded, left behind. Is it true? Is it true that God lives and gives us life? Yes, we say. This day, we hope, I hope, you and I have seen the Lord. Amen. Our hymn of opportunity is number 188, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. Let's stand together and sing.
And the good news of grace is that God, Jesus, does the heavy lifting of salvation and redemption this day and every day. Thank you to the guest musicians for making it beautiful. In just a few moments, we're going to go out and hunt Easter eggs on the front lawn. I've been told there's a guard out there so that nobody took them. Uh, we didn't involve the police, did we? Maybe just a little bit. But uh, they're guarded and they're ready to go. Remember, you will go back down that way and meet in the chapel and go out the doors across the hallway there. But as we go, hear now this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance to you and on this Easter Sunday give you peace and hope, and plenty of courage. Amen.